Blake Islands. I'm the CEO of Lithium Ionic. It's a hard rock, uh, spodumene lithium project in the uh, Lithium Valley of Brazil, which is uh, one of the uh, largest up and coming and, and highest grade hard rock lithium belts in the world. Uh, we are LTH on the TSX venture. We are past the feasibility uh, stage on our project. We are uh, capitalized to uh, to get through an FID and uh, and be in a position to uh, look to construct this project. Expecting permit in the next few months to start building this project uh, and producing almost 200,000 tons of concentrate per annum. So very, very excited to be a, one of the next near-term hard rock lithium producers in the world. I'm Brendan Urich. I'm the CEO of Electric Royalties. Uh, we are a royalty company focused exclusively on clean energy metals, diversified across nine different metals. We've already got 40 royalties in our portfolio, uh, along with another 30 properties optioned out uh, that should become royalties in the near future. Uh, we've got multiple royalties that are expected to enter production here over the next 12 months, uh, with uh, about a half a dozen of our royalties having major updates um, you know, regarding feasibilities, pre-feasibility too, over the next 12 months. So lots of good stuff coming. Um, heavily diversified into clean energy metals. Guys, um, great to have you on. Uh, we're going to talk today about um, battery metals. We're going to talk about um, well, lo lo lots of things. But f first and foremost is about the, the state state of uh, the markets, the mood. Um, it kind of feels like people are a bit bored of the battery story and they're going to storm in off to look at all things gold and precious metals. How are you feeling about lithium at the moment, Blake? Well, I think that probably the, the volatility in price was, uh, you know, a bit nerve wracking for some of the investing space. I think that, um, you know, for a long time uh, when I was marketing this project and, and spodumene price had around to eight, nine thousand dollars a ton, I was I was cautious with with our story all the time and suggesting, look, this is unsustainable. It's probably not going to be the long term price. We need to think about projects that are that are low cost and high margin and high quality and, and those are going to be the projects you're going to want to invest in. I think like anytime something runs, uh, a lot of projects uh, take money out of the space. Some do well, some don't. Um, and so you're in a, a sector that just sort of needs a little time to, to form its business um, and, and let people kind of understand it a little bit better, let price settle out a bit. I think we'll see it recover quite well here in the next while, hopefully not too volatile again. Um, so, you know, it, it's not uncommon I think, to see something pull back like this, see price pull back. But I look to a project like ours where, you know, our all-in sustaining costs is about $500 a ton and and for spodumene. And then the, pro the product is still selling for $1,100, $1,300 a ton. So there's great, good margins on a project like that. So ultimately, you know, I, I, I don't think this is at all surprising to see some of the, you know, the pullback. I think we'll see it, uh, you know, settle into maybe closer to 2000 bucks at some point here and, and be a really healthy business again and, and more investable for the space. But maybe some of that early excitement out of it right now, worried about AI or gold or whatever it's into now, and uh, and we'll, we'll see it come back. So, yeah, we'll just trudge on and, and keep building the project. Yeah, well, we did renegotiate it a few times, three times, uh, you know, over the course of six months. Uh, we definitely took that into effect. But you look at this long term and um, I think the picture is only looking better and better, um, you know, whether it's batteries for cars, batteries for energy storage, uh, you know, demand for lithium is looking at double digit growth here, you know, for the next decade or two decades. So, um, you know, definitely at the beginning of a market, but, you know, it's weird if, when prices go up 20x, right? That's weird. You know, it'd be weird to expect them to stay there. Um, you can imagine if gold prices went to 40,000, you know, an ounce or whatever, 20 X from where they are today, how, how crazy people would go. Um, and so I don't think it's weird that it came back down. I think there's probably been a, a over sell off in the space, you know, prices are still about double where they were, uh, you know, going back four or five years ago. So, um, that's still a pretty good, uh, you know, boost. And I expect that you'll see uh, more times like that for the lithium market coming ahead here for sure. Okay. And um, obviously, I think, Blake, the, I think the other thing that must lend you comfort was the recent uh, royalty financing with Appian. Um, they've clearly got a long-term um, view on this. Uh, what were those conversations like? Um, I think that they were really interesting conversations from the get-go. Um, this is not a, a traditional deal for Appian. I think it speaks volumes to to our project and what they're looking to do. Um, it's the the largest sort of investment through a royalty in, in this belt. Um by you know quantum cash and has a full buyback on it as well which is um really enticing i think for us 
you know, we, we view them as potentially a partner going forward. Um, they love the project. They love the district. They love the belt. And clearly, you know, this is a much smaller, the royalty is a much smaller ticket size than they typically want to jump into. Right. I mean, it's 20 million us. They, they typically want to come in at something that's a hundred, 120 million us. So, um, you know, we, we viewed their, uh, due diligence as thorough, uh, looking at our project. I think that's a huge check mark, uh, for us that, you know, we, we kind of stood the, the test of uh, being due diligence and, and certainly that they view us as, a one of the leading projects in, in this region. So, I mean, it's, it's big, not just bringing cash, but also just, you know, that validating factor of a, of a group that's um, not always easy to satisfy from a due diligence perspective. They, they expect high quality uh, work. They expect high quality projects and, and obviously have a big footprint in Brazil. So, you know, we're excited about it. Um, and uh, as far as the royalty goes, it's, it's not particularly punitive to the NBB of the project and brings in uh, cash that we can use to get, uh, you know, to a to a position to fund the project, it, it, and it's great. But Blake, what, what they've got to believe though to do a deal like this, and, and Brendan will know this. We're talking about royalties here. You, they've got to believe that there's going to be a market for this. There's going to be a route to market where they can you can sell the product. Um, that in fact you get even going to be in a position to have built the thing, produced whatever it is that you're going to produce to sell to the market. So it's it's about I, I guess on the uh, everything you said, the asset and the team and the ability to raise finance to be able to move this thing forward to FID and then and build it. But they got to believe there's a market there. So in terms of that aspect of that conversation and the, that deal that you've done, that surely should lend comfort to the retail market, looking in on projects like yours, projects like Brandon's, say, it's going to be okay. Yeah, you, you would think so. I mean, in, in essence, what they're saying is not just um, upstream, but mid and down that there is a business here. I mean, this is a, a global company um, that that has stepped in now and, and done you know, a, an initial large uh, lithium deal. I mean, clearly they're not doing that for you know a six month turnaround on on what that means. I mean, this is a, a company that has a 10, 20, you know, 10, 12 year outlook on on their money, and and certainly believe in a, a project that can be built quickly. So. I think that anybody who, um, and you know, I'm sure Brendan has, has a good view on this too. And I mean, I think anybody who really looks at this space and looks at the growth um, sees a gap, right? That there there is going to be a supply gap here. Um, that you know, some of these sort of stories of, of many many projects coming online and flooding the market are, I think, hollow. Um, and the next few years are really going to prove that out. And so, you know, high quality projects are are going to, uh, you know, rise to the top. And I think that. For, from our perspective, just get through this sort of little pullback and, and the other side's going to be, uh, you know, bright. But yeah, the, I think anybody who looks at the space understands that, that there's going to be a ton of demand and, um, and, a, and a big future for lithium. So on lithium price, you know, when a market's this early, right? Uh, and so you talk about growth. So let's say a market is a million tons and you're expecting 10% growth. So, you know, an extra 100,000 tons we're going to need next year. But when that market gets to 2 million tons and we're still at 10% growth, we need 200,000 tons of new supply that next year. And so that's really, you know, at the early stages, one small mine comes on production, provides that 100,000 tons, all of a sudden the market swings, deficits, surplus, et cetera. Uh, but as you start to get bigger and that market gets bigger, which it is right now, uh, all of a sudden you're needing much bigger mines to come on land every year. And so I think, you know, obviously the best of the best have already started to kind of get into production off this last uh, price uptick. But, uh, you know, longer term, there's no way that we're going to fill that supply gap um, you know, when you look at the projects that we have available. So, you know, over the long term, this is the new oil, I think, you know, uh, you look 50 years over the next 50 years, this replaces oil uh, slowly over time, you know, slower, probably uh, uh, well, <laughs> a little slower because the oil and gas guys like to keep around for, you know, as long as they can. But uh, that's where the world's headed, you know, and I don't think anybody disagrees with that. So, you know, you look how small the market is today versus, you know, the industry that we're taking over, um, you know, albeit over time here and the growth potential, I think it's unlike anything you've seen, um, you know, previously in the mining space. But, but for you, Brendan, does that inform the the way that what you target in terms of royalties? Because you know, some royalty companies just like to do, we'll do anything. We're going to get the same multiple. It doesn't matter whether it's quality, not quality. We'll get into production. Won't get into production. Um, do, for, for you, looking at this market, as you just explained, we're going to need more and more of this stuff, right? And your 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 view is that how do you go about selecting? what goes into your portfolio and what doesn't because i'm very conscious of what blake said perhaps there's slightly different quality of of project out there 
Sure. So a couple of things. So we actually pick the best assets in North America, Europe, and Australia that could actually be domestic sources of supply for these metals. And so the funny thing is when you look at that, it's a really smaller market. So uh, it's fairly easy, I think, to do a comparable analysis and say, hey, this is the best project for this clean energy model in North America when you look at a subsect like that. So, you know, we're definitely sticking to that geographical focus. There's so many gigafactories coming up under construction in those regions. There's a huge lack of actual critical metals mines, you know, in Europe, North America, uh, and Australia to feed those plants. So we think that's definitely going to, you know, drive the longer term aspect of some of these projects coming in. Uh, so that's definitely a big part of it, uh, I would say, is, is definitely picking, you know, those projects that are best of class in those jurisdictions. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we have nine clean energy metals, which we target. We have exposure to all of them. We see the same opportunity, quite frankly, in, in most of these metals. Um, you know, I think lithium, copper, tin, you know, those are very interesting ones for us. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think this opportunity is really across the board. Um, you know, lithium is maybe one of the better known, you know, metals relative to say tin, which I think, you know, tin prices are up to 33,000 a ton. They're up, you know, 30% just this last year and nobody's mentioned it. Uh, so I think, uh, I think there's a lot of upside really across the board for these metals. So what's, what's happened all of a sudden in terms of this narrative? Like as, as an ex-banker, we used to sit and talk about a critical minerals list, but didn't really kind of give it much sway or, or, or attention. We're just conscious that they're at now, there seems to be a lot more pressure um on governments to identify and, and secure supply um because the, the market seems to have changed changed somewhat you've got companies going upstream investing in lithium companies if that's the thing you've both got in common here lithium companies but uh, across the board on, on these metals yet the money's not flowing the money's not flowing into the junior space it's we're seeing mergers of equals nothing flowing down to juniors. We're seeing government and set incentives, whether it be tax, credits, et cetera, but it's not flowing down to, to the juniors. And and I take your point, Brennan, you know, all of the battery metals are behaving the same way. So it's the same problem across the sector. Something's got to give um, here. So so what, what what's, what's going to change? What needs to change? Like, Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it just, it does feel like, a lot of money is just on the sidelines in general in, in all sectors. I mean, it's not just in, in the battery sector. I think that, um, you know, I, to be totally honest, I mean, if you know, take a macro comment down to a micro, you know, we, we actually aren't seeing a massive sell-off in, in a lot of us. You know, it's just that when selling comes, there's there's no buy side to kind of drive it back up as well. And and I think that there's a bit of a wait and see mentality, I think, um, just probably due to, you know, volatility or what's going on in the world right now or an election in November or whatever that happens to be. Um, I think it's just a little bit of money on the sideline right now. And and so as opposed to, I think, uh, uh, you know, a general massive disbelief or sell off in a space, I think it's just people are kind of waiting a little while to see, okay, what what is the business? What does it look like? What are the projects? What part of the world are they going to come out of? You know, there's these Kind of black box theories around you know what, what's going to come out of africa you know what what, what about reasons we don't really understand what are the chinese doing i mean these are always tough questions i think for you know broad investors or resource investors to to, to pin down and um i think as some of that starts to get flushed out and and the, the reality of the situation kicks in the, the, the gap is there we'll see people jump back into the space my, my hope would actually be that it's not as violent an uptick as last time and we just see sort of more of a gradual set into what you know, the real business is going to be. And, and that's one where, you know, the, the downstream can still make money on a margin and, and the upstream is, is going to do, uh, you know, profitable business as well. But I, I don't, I don't actually, I haven't seen the sentiment be negative on the space or, or not want to be in the space. I just think there's a general sort of malaise in the market right now. Yeah. It's a Blake's point. I think a big part of it is really the opportunity, uh, because there is no buy side, you know, and, and the liquidity is very weak. So, yeah, I think we were up 7% yesterday off 60,000 shares rating. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, and so it wouldn't take much for this to be like a whole different story. Uh, but when you do have sellers and you don't have buy side waiting for it, um, you know, your price can ultimately, you know, drop 10% off of, you know, 25,000 shares rating, which is, you know, has nothing to do with your value. And it's a totally separate thing from, uh, you know, the assets that you hold and, and uh, you know, where the company's going. So I think that is a really big aspect of it. You know, never mind, it's also summertime. Uh, but I think that's the opportunity for retail investors to really go in and pick up some of these stocks that are uh, super cheap ahead of, you know, springtime. It's funny, Brandon, it's becoming like there's summer, there's Christmas, 
There's tax loss. There's it's like there's like a three week window to for us to run business. <laughs> I know it feels but like it's getting shorter every year. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I, th I think it's supposed to be three three years of um, the normal rules not applying. Quite frankly, um, with with COVID, etc. And I think maybe we have to accept that retail investors got a lot, lot less um, disposable income and discretionary spend available to them. So there's a little bit of that going on, not to mention the sort of cr crushing losses that perhaps some people have had to um, take along the way. Um, so may maybe the, there's a slight new paradigm from that regard, um, psychologically. Um, but I, I, I'm kind of with Brendan on this one. It's like, if you're a contrarian investor, if you've got the balls to be a contrarian investor, there's some deals to be had, and I guess the, the 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 question for you guys is, and you both hinted at it, you know, not all projects, not all companies are born equal. There's um there's still a lot of um, not so good things out there. So what what are you looking for when you're investing, Brett Blake, Blake on? What yeah, do you think? sure. Better, so, not, better not better not name names, but just, just I, yeah, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Brandon, you go, you go, and I'll yeah. Yeah, well, we've we've done quite a few deals. You know, now we're diversified across seventy two assets. Uh, we do, you know, go after nine different clean energy metals. So we are definitely aiming to be diversified. Um, and so, you know, I think if you look at our portfolio, if it goes ten percent right, we're doing great. Um, you know, especially at this valuation. So. Uh, diversification is a really big key uh, for us in terms of investing. Um, I think it's really hard to say that any certain one project is going to work out uh, just because there's it's very difficult to mine. You know, there's so many things that are outside of your control. So diversification is definitely key. Um, looking at the management teams, though, you know, and those best in class projects. So, you know, really comparing, you know, what is actually out there to invest in. Um, you know, the problem for most retail investors is that can be very complicated. You know, I've been looking at projects and, you know, all over the world basically for 12 years now. So, you know, we've got a team of people that's also likewise done that, you know, many cases longer than I have. So um, it can be tough for retail investors to kind of sort through that. But we do do a very deep dive on the technical side of things. Um, but, you know, looking at management teams is always a good one. Um, and then, you know, trying to be diversified. So, you know, sticking with uh, multiple assets instead of uh, one shot at the can. Yeah, look, I think that anytime I'm looking at a, a newer space, I would consider this a newer space for most investors. I look for simplicity. Uh, I think things that are, you know, uh, straightforward don't require anybody to, you know, reinvent the wheel or do something that hasn't been done before. I tend to like to jump into that stuff early. And I think that while new technology and new science are, are going to drive uh, a lot of these businesses in the future, I, I think near term and short term, you know, I certainly look for things that, that are simple, uh, low cost, easy to, to kind of jump into and, and see a clear path forward. And you know, tag that onto to jurisdiction. I think those two things are, are, you know, key components for me. I'm a technical guy by background, so I could jump into a lot of it. But generally speaking, I, I, I think when I look at projects like that, I, I look at there. Let's minimize how many things can go wrong between you know here and and production. So you know, those those are things that I'm certainly in a new space that I that I look for. And I think there are a, good a lot one. of those out there. You know, there's yeah. good ones. Simplicity is a really good one too. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely don't look at groups that are trying to create new technologies just so that their project works, you know, cause that's more of a, that's not even a mining thing anymore. You know, that's a science project on the side. So there's a lot of technologies out there that are, are in the works. Um, you know, like Blake, I do believe these things will work out, you know, at some point down the road, uh, but sticking with stuff where they don't have to invent something new, um, you know, just to make something work, I think is definitely a, you know, simplicity is a good one. Yeah, I think so. We, we, we saw, I think it was a couple of years ago now, a, a project where a copper company is trying to use ISR as a new means of extraction. And yeah, new, innovative, didn't work. In um, copper? Uh, copper. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they use that in uranium. And I've seen a few copper groups uh, that have tried that. There's one, I think, actually right now going into construction. So, um, yeah. It, it is interesting. There has been a few, you know, in situ leach copper mines, but not too many. Not too many that made money, that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well, look, let, let, let's talk about sort of some of the things that are available to you, given given this new world we're looking at. Obviously, you just done that, like you did the, the Appian deal, but what we, you must have looked around at alternative financing, Blake, say, well, come on, we need, we need to kind of shore up our, our balance sheet. We've got a great project here. We want to kind of get on with stuff rather than sit back and hunker down. What are the what are the options available to you, and, and what are the sort of group, types of groups that you spoke to before you can kind of settle on on Appian? Yeah, I mean, we, we talked to all of them. I, I think there's there was maybe a misconception in doing a royalty as well from some 
some investors was that, you know, this was the kind of money you could get. I mean, there was, there's lots of money out there. I mean, I think the investment space is still very much there. They're just not jumping into the market to, to push stocks one way or another. But, you know, I, I think along the way, if we, if we pick the route of, of just sort of bringing capital in from an equity perspective, that was always out there in front of us for, for the kind of smart long-term investors. But for us, you know, we wanted to do something that was non or, or certainly less dilutive. And that was really driven largely um, by, uh, you know, a focus we've had for, for quite a few months. And we've looked at every path, whether that be their offtake, we looked at, you know, different kind of convert options and royalty options. And ultimately, um, you know, we settled on sort of a, a simple royalty plan. And it just took, you know, quite a long time to, to get across the line because of extensive due diligence and the work that had to go into it and the value that was being created. So, you know, I think for us, um, you know, we, we are in a place now where, you know, as that closes, we, we can kind of jump back into, you know, the project financing discussions. And from that perspective with pricing pulling back, yes, some of the excitement from some names have, have come out, but really the, the long-term investors, the, the, you know, the off takers and the, the debt financers and the partners are, are still out there looking. And I think that, you know, the, the bold ones are going to pick up really good projects or, you know, invest in, in really good projects now. Um, so, you know, we're, we're having those conversations and had those conversations for, for months, um, and, and continue to, but, um, yeah, I think for us, we have to look through the market now here a little bit and, and obviously push through to, you know, be a, a producer as, as soon as possible. And this market's perfect for royalties. You know, it's custom built for companies when they're undervalued, you know, to go in there because you have to write a big equity check when your valuation is where it is. Um, and that can, that can really, you know, eat away at, at what part of the project you get longer term. Uh, so royalty is really custom made for these markets. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. I think, you know, we're definitely going to be uh, heating it up a little bit in terms of some of the deals that we're able to go after, especially over the summer here, because uh, there is a lack of capital, I think, out, you know, for certain situations. Um, and uh, definitely, I think, you know, groups like ours can definitely help plug plug that gap, um, you know, in the foreseeable future. Yeah, and just the appetite for the company to, to issue that equity at those. I mean, we as our example, we went from two dollars to sixty five cents. Yeah, we don't want to issue a bunch of equity at those levels. So yeah, and I think that's that's very much right. Like for a project, if it can make sense and not be too much weight on it, um, and and work with a partner that it is truly a partner long term, I think it's a great way to solve some of those issues in, in a market like this for for the, for the corp. I would never have given you a full buyback though. That's a good deal, <laughs> or you can totally eliminate the royalty. You never would have got that with me, but uh, well done. Yeah, we're pretty happy. Well, with that. actually, well, to, to, to your to your point, Brandon. I mean, it it kind of works both ways, right? You know, in the sense that you know the, the type of money that's available to you will help sh inform and shape the types of deals that you do, because you're not going to kind of rush to do a convert if your whole portfolio is, you know. Um, you know, long, long view, i.e. you're not going to get any revenue from them for, you know, five years. So you're going to have to get that balance right to be able to kind of support the type and the, the mix of the financing available to you, no? Yeah, we've been super lucky because we've got a very supportive shareholder who's basically given us, you know, a $10 million facility that's one of a kind. You know, we have no payments on that really for the next four years. Uh, it's all convertible into shares at a much higher share price, you know, over 200% from where we're at today. Um, and so, yeah, over that time frame, we feel very comfortable. And so we still have 3 million left with them, uh, to go out and do new deals. But at some point here, you know, hopefully the market will reevaluate us and, uh, you know, it'll be a little bit easier to raise equity because, you know, the whole reason we're using that is our equity price. We also feel, you know, is way too undervalued to, to be raising equity at these prices. Uh, but we've been very lucky to have, like I said, this, uh, very supportive shareholder, Stephen Gleason, uh, supporting us, but not every group has that out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not going to have an infinite amount, so we will have to, you know, address that, um, here in the near future. But I think if you look at what we've done in the past, bringing in co-investment from other groups, uh, there's a lot of private money that would love to be in royalties. Uh, but funnily enough, they just don't invest in public royalty companies. Um, you know, and so I think that's, there's a lot of money out there for us to put deals together, uh, and for them to kind of come in and finance that. You know, as long as they're getting a piece of that deal. Okay. Look, guys, um, I think there's a g general, well, I think, I mean, don't know if it was in your mouth, but it seems to be pa patience is required, quality, go after quality, uh, and perhaps the markets will be okay. It just, at the moment, people are trying to waiting for whatever signals they're waiting for. I suspect the US election is, is a pretty big one. 
Um, guys, why don't we kind of wrap up, maybe give t- t- two minutes to each of you in terms of you know, your, your elevator pitch to investors looking and listening and reading about this, you know, as to why they should pick up your stock. Do you want to go with that, Blake? Yeah, absolutely. I think I've sort of quietly been plugging myself all along here, but, uh, you know, I think lithium ionic. That's the idea. Yeah, I mean, like, I, yeah. Um, uh, simplicity. No, it's it's really, I mean, it's about, uh, you know, lithium ionic it is in a belt. It, a very unique belt in a sense that, you know, from uh, the rocks up, it really is only comparable to Western Australia. And so when you look at that, it's, it's a massive opportunity. Um, one project now uh, producing in Sigma at scale, we've already got a 30 year producer in CBL. There's proof of concept all around us. And, you know, if you look at discovery rate from, from the companies that have, have moved in the last two years, I mean, I think we're at something at 10 or 15,000 tons a month uh, of, of, you know, or being, being discovered at this point. And, and that's all, you know, with, with pretty limited drilling so far. So it's really probably, you know, bias aside, one of the most important hard rock belts, you know, developing right now. And, Tack on top of that, that it's in a it's in a state in Minas Gerais that's a mining state that that's you know highlighted this as as a key um, area to to develop and and lithium being a key focus for that belt as well. So complete you know a very supportive government, a very a supportive social situations. These are small footprint projects, um, so their permit timelines are, are are quick as well. You know, knock on wood, but you know right now we have a good line of sight on on a project that could be up and running in, in 2026 that is high grade low cost you know low cost to build and, and high margin even in these kind of pulled back prices so for for me yeah i think your your point about being patient in this space is right i think that the savvy investor who has the guts right now is, is going to do very very well on on projects like this and, and many projects like this that are out there um but yeah i would think right now it's uh it's a uh, you know, come show us kind of market, show us what you're going to do. And, and we're going to have to just continue to do that. So it'll be an exciting uh, few months out of us. Yeah. So, uh, so we're a royalty company, right? So, I mean, you, we have 40 royalties. We don't have to put a single dollar in towards development. Those are all going to march towards production uh, at uh, no cost to us. And so, you know, you look at our portfolio this year, there's four of our royalties, which you know, have the potential end of production and start paying cash flow to us. You know, if you look at over the next five to six years, you know, we see that portfolio getting up to 20, 25 million a year in cash flow annually. Uh, and that's about our market capitalization today, you know. So um, I think if you look at the valuation opportunity right now, uh, we're extremely cheap. Um, I'd say we're low risk. We're very diversified, right? We've got 72 assets. Uh, GNA is very low. So, you know, it's about a million and a half a year. Um, one or two of those comes on, we're cash flow positive. Uh, and then, you know, we don't have to raise any money. Um, and it's really just kind of golden from there. So, I mean, you look at the opportunity, we're very low risk on the downside. Um, and I look at the uh, pricing upside across all of our metals. You know, if prices go up, we our revenues go up by the exact same proportion. Uh, it's one of the beauties of the royalty company business model. So um, definitely where we're at today is a good entry point. Um, you know, we have a ton of different catalysts expected here over the next 12 months. So investors definitely shouldn't stay uh, on the sidelines too long. Guys, appreciate your time today. Um, thanks very much. Bye.